Okay, so we've got a, a few different things that we're going to talk about today. I'm going to start off by just finishing the the overview of OP1 that Dr. Tallman and I were doing last week. Uh, we talked about slide design, and uh, we didn't talk about one last slide. So what's the last slide that you put up for your Q&A? So you end your presentation, and in this presentation and in most others in your career, you, you're going to take questions afterwards. So... So that, that's what I think our final slide should be. Nice and simple, clean questions. Uh, I see, <laughs> see Isidore says, put up, please give me a good mark. You're trying to convey that message, but sometimes you want to be uh, a little subliminal about it. <laughs> so, uh, so Ken, what do you think about this? How do you like this as our, our final slide? <clears throat> well, Vaughn, you know, I, it, it doesn't uh, give me much reference back to the presentation like uh, if you if you had some graphic up there that reminded me maybe of a key point uh from the presentation one of the key features that you maybe want to discuss in the q a or something to get the conversation going yeah okay so so dr tallman pre prepared an alternative slide how about this one for the for the final presentation so any thoughts from the class? Ken, it's your slide. What do you think of it? <laughs> so why do you, well, why do you like this from one? A few that it's kind of ugly, uh, some that, that it's kind of perfect. And, um, you know, I would say that, that providing that the, that the two graphics there go back to some of the key points from the presentation, it's pretty good, right? It gives you something to work with. And it's, it's likely that some of the questions might be actually aimed at those graphics. Uh, so it's okay. Okay. What do you think, Vaughn? You, maybe you're not so sure. Uh, so yeah, I like this too. I mean, I tend to like simple slides, but I find this one's not too complicated. Uh, some people are saying it's ugly, so you can create your own, you know, maybe, maybe our graphic design skills are not the best and you can do better. But I guess I like this one because our team, we've decided you know, our core message is going to be adaptability. and We get that message right at the end. This is what we all want you to remember about our team. And we'll put up a couple of pictures to help you remember. So in my opinion, yeah, it's more, it's more interesting than this. We're ending, we're going to take questions. You're going to be looking at this for a minute. So we put up a little bit, so a little bit of information to leave our key idea in your mind while that Q and A is happening. So uh, let's see. Did I use Google Maps without citing it? I can't actually remember where I got that from. That might be MapQuest. I'm not sure. Uh, so maybe it is an academic integrity violation, as, uh, as someone in the chat is saying. Uh, so we would, maybe we'll get docs and marks for that. You guys should not do that. Okay. Then the last thing is, okay, that's our last slide that we put up while we're doing Q&A. What about the Q&A itself? A few principles. One thing is sometimes questions are vague. That'd probably be less of an issue in your presentation because your CI knows how to ask a question. I see this all the time in conferences. I saw it all the time when I was in industry. If you get a question and you, you just don't know what the, what the question really means. So it's perfectly fine to clarify it. You can say, uh, okay, I think what you're asking is, do we really need environmental adaptation? Because maybe I didn't really know what the person was asking. So I don't want to spend three minutes answering the wrong question. So I'm going to spend some time trying to figure out, is that the right question or not? Second thing we want to do is you want to give a, take a few seconds, organize your thoughts, and give a succinct and organized answer. And sometimes this is actually a good way to get those few seconds. You ask for, is this what you mean? And while you're asking that, you're thinking, how do I organize this? Um, so... Uh, Ken, why don't, why, don't, why don't we try this? Okay, so we're, we're, we're at the end of our Q&A. Let's see if we can answer some questions well. Sounds good. So, so Vaughn, let, let, can I pose a question to you just to kind of get us started here? Sure. Um, so what was, the, what was the core message that, that you were trying to deliver today in the presentation? Yeah, great question. Great question, Ken. So the, the core message as made to stick pointed out is really the essence of what you're trying to get to. And we had that right in focus all the time that we were building the map and hopefully it came across during the presentation. 
it's the night mode is really about trying to see better have uh well chosen colors contrast and help you be a a safer driver through gis usability engineering and that's really what we have been about great great thanks vaughn um so uh all of you out there uh what do you think of vaughn's answer was was this a, a good answer not so good model engineering okay josh was saying it beat around the bush um Maybe it's getting, a bit, it's getting right? more harsh. So it's gone from model yeah, to six uh, out of 10. Spoken like you're on the bush, no clue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so Vaughn, if I tried to answer the question, maybe I'd say that um, uh, our, our core message is that our map is safe. Okay, so I ask you, yeah, so, what do you think of of Ken's answer? How do you like that? Okay. Or, or Vaughn, maybe better, our map ensures user safety. Makes sense. Okay, so I see one person saying maybe. better. I, my answer was very meandering. So everyone who beat up on it of like, yeah, it was a bit of a was meandering, it was, it was perhaps a word salad. I did say safety in there, or maybe I mentioned night mode adaptation, but I wrapped it with all sorts of superfluous, superfluous, no, superfluous, sorry, <laughs> uh, words about, you know, made to stick and, you know, your CI has seen answers like this before. Engineers that you will work with have seen answers like this before. They're saying, I don't quite know what to say. I'm going to pull, pull some words out of your question and I'm going to try to like dance around a bit. So it wasn't great. Um, and yeah, I mispronounced superfluous, superfluous. So I'm going to stop using that word. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it wasn't very good, right? There was a little bit of information there. It was wrapped in a lot of words. Uh, Ken's answer was much more concise. Oh, Ken, maybe what you might want, maybe the best of both worlds, or maybe a better answer still would be to start with a really concise statement, but then flesh it out a little bit, you know, why? So you said that our key goal, our core intent was safety. Maybe you could link that back to some key things that we saw in the presentation. Maybe that 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 night mode helps to ensure the our user safety. Yeah. So maybe it's our key goal was safety, and we felt that driving at night is a fundamentally dangerous activity, and we could make it better through night mode, and that's what we focused on. So, you know, maybe that is an answer that fleshes things out a little bit more because too short an answer can also feel sometimes like you haven't given me enough. You haven't given me the, the, the why or the evidence, but my answer was clearly too long and kind of wandered around with a lot of un unnecessary stuff. Okay, so that, that that's, that's it for me for questions, unless you have any more uh, thoughts on that, Ken. <clears throat> Yeah, no, no, and, and and we're getting good comments, and 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 these are, uh, you know, if we had a chance to uh, to practice a little more, we 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 would we would improve, and we'd certainly improve with uh, the feedback that we're getting. I think we're getting lots of good feedback, and uh, so just as you all improve from getting feedback, we too improve. Uh, yeah, from well, and, and sometimes we uh, you don't never know why when we're doing it on purpose and when that's just really the best we could do. <laughs> So that's, yeah. that's one of the prerogatives we have as professors. Um, Ken, why don't I turn it over to you now? Okay, good. Let me... So I'll need to share my screen. Um, this will stop. Okay, continue. Okay, I think Good. So, um, just one last thing I want to say about uh, about OP one uh, is that we're going to be asking you to do peer review uh, of your classmates uh, during the the presentations, and uh, I was I was looking actually just yesterday at a. Uh, 
uh, a 2014 uh, peer-reviewed uh, uh, scholarly article on peer review, on the value of peer review. And, and one of the interesting things that uh, the, the paper uh, kind of uh, claims uh, or argues is that, um, is that writing reviews provides as much or more learning potential than simply, than simply uh, receiving feedback. Um, so by giving peer review, you learn just as much or more than you do by receiving it. And so I guess the message there is that it's a good thing to, a good thing to practice um, to improve your, your own skills. And um, so that's a, a kind of an interesting uh, perspective that you might, uh, you, you know, might consider. Uh, this is the form that we've been using in the past for peer review. And we may we're modified a little bit this year, um, given that we're gonna be doing this remotely on Zoom. You see, we, we kind of ask that you consider the, the, the content, what's working well, what could be improved, the organization and flow of the presentation, the slide design, uh, how well the team is interacting, uh, the team interaction with audience, uh, vocal projection, vocal pace. And we, as I say, we may modify this a bit, but you can expect that it'll be kind of similar to this. And, um, this is maybe a little bit hard to read, but I thought I'd include it because it was a nice example of what a, a student did uh, during, during peer review. Um, I can read some of this for you that uh, what's working well, a lot of good content, which connects back to a certain story, um, so good intro and conclusion, what could be improved, connect back more about responsiveness and usability. With organization and flow, there was a good story to start off. Um, and uh, th throughout the presentation, uh, could be improved, have an agenda next time. Uh, for a slide design, good use of graphics to be improved, could uh, use better font, larger size font. Anyways, you can see that it's, it, it's kind of very specific, uh, mostly very constructive and uh, kind of very actionable. So these kinds of comments, I would think would be very helpful for the team as they go forward to OP2. And you can think when you give this feedback to your classmates that that's a, a good goal, that, that you give your classmates something that will help them improve uh, for OP2. Um, so we'll be talking a little bit more about the, the peer review uh, before we get to, uh, to OP1, but I just wanted to quickly uh, introduce that to you. And so I'm going to do uh, a quick debrief on WD1. Uh, you'll get the opportunity with your CI to do this in your weekly meeting, but I thought we could spend a little bit of time as a group looking at a couple of examples. I, I asked a couple of teams if they would be willing to share their work and uh, very generously agreed that we could take a look at it today. And so what I did is I chose two samples of uh, the opening uh, introduction and the beginning of uh, section two from the two documents. Because so I thought there it's kind of easiest to look at the setup rather than to look at uh, later sections in the document. And um, so I'm going to give you a minute to take a look. This is the first uh, uh, paragraph and the first figure in, uh, in example one. And if you could, just in the chat, uh, indicate a few things that you think are working well, a few things that could be improved, just kind of quick, uh, quick responses. So a good application diagram, um, 
good, very concise. The main idea directly relates to the diagram. Yeah, so that's uh, uh, effective. Um, concise gives a good idea what the document will do. Um, one of you saying the intro could be uh, could be more specific. Um, so lots of lots of uh, different uh, thoughts, but mainly kind of positive, positive uh, first impression. And my own sense is that it's kind of a nice page design. It's inviting. It's kind of nice to look at. It looks clean. Um, there's a useful definition of of of, uh, of GIS with a helpful graphic. Uh, so that's all good to get us uh, kind of uh, started with with the document. Um, small point, perhaps, to uh, write out the full name before using the acronym. Uh, so geographic information system. Um, and I thought as well that they've chosen these three different GIS from different fields, and kind of makes me wonder why. Why these three? And it's not a big point, but um, there must have been some thought that went into the choice. And uh, so I thought that it would be worthwhile to include an extra sentence, explain the, explain the reasoning behind the choice of the three GIS. Good, so it moves on then to, uh, to section two, the state of the art review. And this is the text. So again, Anything you see that you like, positive, or maybe a few things that you think could be improved. So the first, the first sentence uh, kills the word count. <clears throat> okay, okay. Yeah. Full of definitions. Yeah, so Sanjana, is that a good thing that it's full of definitions or do you think that uh, works against its effectiveness? A lot of quotes, kind of an information overload. Okay, so not not as quite as positive, perhaps, about the uh, <clears throat> the text now that they're into section two. Um, a few of the things that I I observed. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think that it's a good thing to start with definitions of usability and responsiveness. At some point, you're going to have to do it. And it's better to get it over with early, I think, in the document so that then once you start to discuss the three GIS, we have a pretty clear understanding of how these terms apply to kind of all of the GIS that you're going to uh, discuss. You know, if the, if the definitions change with each GIS, then we're not so confident that we understand these uh, principles too well. Um, this seemed, I, I agree that the first sentence was a bit of a, a, a bit harsh on, on, the, on the word count. And I was wondering, you know, screenshots will explain usability. Well, <clears throat> screenshots might show it, show how something's usable. They won't specifically explain. And other references, I'm wondering, well, what other kinds of references? It's always dangerous to <clears throat> include something that's this vague. So I think either being more specific or simplifying here, uh, you know, and it may be that we, we don't even really need all of this because once we get to the second sentence, we're going to have citations, we're going to be able to know where these definitions are coming from. And so this first sentence is probably not so uh, useful. Um, when we get here, the, the, the wording is uh, 
somewhat inaccurate responsiveness is the graphic user interface. Not really accurate. It's, it has more to do with the, the speed at which the, we, the user and, and which the, you know, we can use the graphics. So it's not the interface itself, but the speed. Um, the list, it's kind of strange here that the, the, the writer has, has first started by uh, defining usability and then responsiveness. And then after defining responsiveness goes back to the three points that were included in the definition of usability. And we're getting a little bit lost. It's out of sequence. Um, so there should be something to signal that the writer is going back to discuss usability. And also the, um, the it's, out of, it's out of sequence here. <clears throat> uh, at the earlier, it was effectiveness, efficiency, satisfaction. Now it's efficiency, effectiveness, satisfaction. Small point, but as a reader, you kind of pick up on those kinds of things and you go, hmm, not careful enough, right? We, we would expect that the, the sequence here, effectiveness, efficiency, satisfaction would be repeated. Um, just looking at a few of the responses uh, in the chat. Um, so wait, the whole sentence is responsiveness is the, gee, who's got, yeah, no, I, I, I see the way that the, the, the sentence goes. It's, it's, the, um, it's just the way that the, the verb here connects with the object. Responsiveness is the user interface. Um, not, not quite accurate. Um, yeah, and that the list is in, in different order. Um, and then when I was reading the quotation here, it, it seemed like it wasn't quite making sense to me, a system producing useful output as a percentage of inputs. And so I actually just went back to the quotation just to check, I went back to the source to look and it is produces and kind of a small point, but uh, whenever we're quoting sources, we wanna take extra care that we're getting it right. It's kind of our responsibility as uh, members of you know, the, the academic community that, um, that we're, we take that, that kind of extra care when we're quoting. I thought that the definitions themselves of efficiency, effectiveness, and satisfaction, I thought these were useful. I thought these would be uh, effective and productive going forward. And, and the main point I guess here is, is that you wanna have these definitions kind of upfront so that by the time you get into your analysis of the three different GIS in the state of the art review, that you've got these terms already established for your reader so that you can quickly then assess each of the GIS with these criteria. And I'll just take one last uh, example here. This is then the, um, the next uh, entry in, the, uh, in the, the document. So looking at the first uh, GIS. So Isidore is noting that this is a particularly relevant GIS. <clears throat> yeah, uh, uh, I think a number of teams uh, used this. Um, Wei Hang is saying, I don't think the focus should be on, uh, on, Dr., on Dr. Jacob or on Dr. Nielsen, if the section is on GIS analysis. And um, 
And that's, a, that's kind of a good point, Wyhan, because I noticed a number of students when they're, um, you know, they're citing a source, they include the name of the author, the writer, sometimes even the title of the publication in the text. And, um, you know, if you take a look at the IEEE guidelines, they're, they're pretty clear that we don't need to do that unless there's a good reason to draw attention to a particular person that we want the, uh, the audience to know about. Otherwise, often the citation itself is sufficient. And then if we wanted to go back uh, and look in the list of references, we could. Um, I know that, uh, that Nielsen is something of an expert, so maybe you would decide you want to include the author in this case. It was something to pay some attention to. Um, and uh, in many cases, I myself noted that we didn't necessarily need to know who wrote it. We're more just we're more interested in, in what they wrote and, and the citation. So I thought here that it's it's good to include a usability subsection. It's a nice way to organize the uh, the, the state-of-the-art review that with each of the GIS, you might create a kind of a subheader for usability and then a subheader for responsiveness. That might be a good way to organize this section for each of the three GIS. So I like that, uh, uh, that, that organization. Um, again, it's kind of clean page design, uh, easy, to, easy to navigate, not too busy. Um, I was wondering here why the, the ESRI ARC uh, GIS is prevalent in healthcare. And it's kind of a good point because it's true, but, but um, it, it's the kind of statement that then we want to know a little bit more. Is it something that they do that, that, that is particularly effective that makes that so? Or is it a particular interest that they have that the organization has in healthcare? Um, you know, and I guess it's sort of the principle that if you're going to go there and make the statement, good thing to be prepared to say a little bit more. So why is it that, that this is so? Um, now here with the, the usability attributes in the page above, there were three usability attributes and now it's changed, it's five. They're, they're, they're similar and I can see that in the parentheses, it's making accommodation for the previous list, um, but it 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 it, uh, it confused me a little bit. I was going, well, I thought it was three, and so now I've got these new terms to deal with, and so I was wondering about that. And um, and then when getting to the discussion on Figure Two, the information is uh, is lucid. And um, uh, I was wondering, well, which usability attribute is this? Is this, uh, does this have to do with, with efficiency? Um, with, I wasn't quite sure what, uh, what the point was there. I needed a little, little clarification. Um, and then here, the statement that the map is learnable since users can zoom and navigate by dragging. Now I could see that that would be what would make it interactive, but I wasn't quite sure how that would make it learnable. So um, again, there I wanted a little more uh, clarification. Um, and then finally here that the real-time updates and the quantity of data presented uh, signal effectiveness. And so I was wondering in what way, explain further. Um, that doesn't uh, in itself kind of uh, indicate what it is about those two things that make it effective. Um, and I'll just go quickly through this um, uh, other document just to, and I'll post these, these slides after so you can take a look. Um, and these are just, you know, sort of a, you know, a somewhat careful reading of, of, of the, uh, the, these two uh, introductory sections. Um, I like that this is a concise introduction. It's, it's kind of to the point. Um, I would suggest maybe working a little bit on finding better verbs. It's something that I 
always recommend that if you can get your verbs working, that everything else tends to kind of fall into place. And I guess here, this document, uh, I, I guess it presents our proposal or puts forth our proposal. And based on our state of the art review, we have found features. And I think here, the better verb would probably be something like selected. Found, it could be that you found them, but it, but it, it found it's a little more passive than selected. Selected is then that you, you made some choices that were a little bit more um, uh, uh, conscious and, and, and uh, had a, a purpose, a sense of purpose, establishes more purpose. Um, should we define GIS here? Do you think we need to define GIS? Well, probably a good thing to do right at the beginning of the document. What is GIS? It, it, uh, it, it's uh, defined in many different ways. So that would be useful to, to do that. Um, and my thought here is that the, the introduction should explain that usability and responsiveness are important to the proposal. Or alternately, the next section should establish their importance and not simply introduce the topics. So here we have usability and responsiveness sort of defined for us, but we aren't quite sure why they're important to the report. There's um, nothing in the introduction that mentions them. And then in the state of the art review, they're simply sort of defined for us. So we don't know why they're defined. We don't know why they're important to the, uh, to the report. Um, and then just a small point here with having to do with responsiveness that programs that take too long to load cause frustration, reduce users experience or satisfaction. And just wondering if we, if we do we need to say that? Um, probably not, probably goes without saying. Um, and just, just uh, quickly to, to wrap up, um, when you have a header and a subheader, what do you think? I'm not sure what you learned uh, or how you were instructed in APS 111.12. Kind of standard usually that there's some kind of text that sets up the, the section. Um, and it could be even that uh, this opening sentence, this map of the world provides an overview of the COVID-19 virus outbreak, put that up here, maybe a little bit more. And then the section itself actually begins with a specific discussion of responsiveness rather than beginning with a, uh, just a, a an explanation of the uh, the map itself that's uh, not so specifically connected to responsiveness, um, and here maybe a bit confusing that uh, considering responsiveness and usability, kind of expect here that the discussion would would focus on responsiveness. Um, Good to signal the figure, right? As shown in figure one, uh, it's actually going up above, but um, good to, to make that uh, clear. And, um, and good to support the claim with research, right? Uh, something that most of you did a good job with in the, uh, the assignment. And then lastly, um, just looking at, at this section, I would say it's unusual to begin this section, even a subsection with furthermore, Subsection usually begins as a kind of a new fresh uh, start in a sense, right? So to uh, expect that the reader is going to follow a point from the previous section is uh, unusual. Um, and then it's, it's unclear to me here that the text is discussing figure three. There's no, no signal to it, so I'm not quite sure where to look here. Um, I thought here that in terms of what the map is showing in figure three, that this is a good observation. That's a, I think that, that makes a kind of a, a good sense to, to point that out. And, uh, and I thought that, that the, the discussion here, it's, it, it's pointing to some of the shortcomings with, with this particular map, with the Johns Hopkins uh, COVID-19 map, particularly in terms of the 
uh, well, the responsiveness and the usability. And I thought that it's good to provide an honest appraisal, right? That you considered it in a, in a very balanced kind of way. And, and here, I thought this was a little too late to, to, to finally signal figure three. Would have been good to, uh, to get that up uh, a little bit earlier. So just a, a quick kind of takeaway from this. Um, you know, it's a good thing to, to practice reviewing, critiquing your peers' work. Um, I hope I didn't seem too harsh here. I was trying to give it a kind of careful reading, but you want to be kind, you want to show positives. Um, and, and uh, you know, maybe I could have done more to, to uh, indicate those, but, um, you know, that's kind of an important part of, 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 of giving uh, feedback. Um, and being constructive, suggesting changes, asking questions, kind of uh, avoiding telling someone, someone what to do. But um, I often find that asking questions is a, a good alternative to that. Ask them how they might think about doing it a little bit differently or um, if this makes good sense, that kind of thing. And, um, and then finally consider how you can apply your review of others' work to your own work. Um, I think that's the, the point from that earlier uh, article that I was referring to at the beginning, uh, discussing peer review, that, that one of the main benefits of peer review is how it can help you improve your own work uh, through reviewing others. So I think that's a, a kind of a key takeaway here. So Vaughn, I, I probably took a little too much time here, but I'll, I'll let you uh, uh, finish up now, unless there's any, any questions. Um, I wasn't able to follow all of the chat, but I'll take a look at it as as uh, as Professor Betts gets started up. Uh, sure. The, the, if there are any questions, you know, feel free to take them. We're not in a huge rush. Okay. All right. It seems that uh, maybe we're good to go to the next topic, though. Let me just uh, get the video set up. So it's recording the right thing. Okay. So on to a, a different topic. So milestone three. So now you're still working on milestone two. Um, but we'll start. I posted milestone three and we'll start going through what does it consist of? Uh, is there a last milestone? There is a milestone four. Milestone four is probably not as much work and, and we'll see. Well, basically milestone four is generally not that hard to get going. And then you can see how much you want to optimize. Time's a bit short this year. So we're not going to expect too much optimization in milestone four. So, but let's talk about milestone three. What is it doing? So you're looking for the sh driving paths. So you want to find the shortest driving time between two intersections. So this is obviously a useful thing to do in a map application, and it's actually an important graph algorithm. So it'll teach you some useful things about how do you write fast algorithms and graphs. There are a lot of important algorithms that work on graphs and shortest path, which is what you're doing for this driving directions, is actually a very important algorithm and highlights a lot of uh, interesting design decisions about how you make an algorithm fast. So this milestone is worth 16% of your final mark. Um, 8% of it is auto marked. So the EC297 exercise plus some private tests. And those auto mark tests kind of break down into three categories. First, do you find any path at all? So we give you two intersections and can you actually find a way to go in between them at all? Um, you'll get a few marks for doing that. But uh, to get more marks, you want it to be a short path. So maybe you found a path that wanders all over the place and gets eventually to the destination. Uh, that's not going to be considered a really good path. A good path is going to have short travel time. And in fact, we want the path that has the shortest travel time. If there are a bunch that are very close, that's okay. Then any one of those will be acceptable. But we would accept this. Uh, let me draw this again. We would accept you know, this green path as a legal path. And you'll pass the, did you get a legal path test? but we wouldn't accept it as a good travel time path. Only the red one that I've shown there would be a good travel time path, only it would pass 
you know, the somewhat harder tests that are, is your path a short travel time or we call them optimality tests. And then finally, this can actually be a pretty computationally intensive algorithm, depending on how you how clever your algorithm is and how well it's coded. So we're going to test your CPU time. So there'll be some tests where the CPU time is relatively easy to meet. Well, the first there'll be some tests with no CPU time limits. Then there'll be some where the CPU time pretty easy to meet, some where it's medium, some where it's hard. And depending on how many of these tests you pass, it'll affect you know exactly what your mark is out of eight here. So uh, it's not binary marking, so you don't have to go all about failing some tests. Is that a disaster? Most solutions will fail some tests. So try to pass all the tests, but if you don't pass them all, obviously you get part, part marks. Uh, that's only part of the milestone. The other part of the milestone is your user interface. So you have an algorithm, but now you want people to be able to use it. So they have to be able to ask for travel directions somehow, and you're going to demonstrate that to your TA, and your TA will fill out a rubric and give you a mark based on how usable that interface is and, and how stable it is. And then just like the first two milestones, 2% of your mark will come from how you did it. What's your code style? How well did you manage your project? Your wiki's clear, etc. It's due um, in a little more than three weeks. So Thursday, April 1st, and uh, at the end of the day. So we're trying to give you as much time as we can. That's the next day is a holiday, so it's hard for us to go to the Friday. So we're doing it as late as we can on the Thursday. Okay, and I see somebody noticed it's uh, April Fool's, which is true. I hadn't noticed that. Uh, I saw someone asking, is there is there a competitive component to this? No. So basically, you are trying to pass as many tests as you can, and you're trying to make a nice user interface. There's no ranking between teams or anything like that. Okay, so you have to find these driving paths. And the way we're going to evaluate your driving paths is, you know, how long the path takes to drive. And that's basically just the distance you drive divided by the speed limit on each part of the, uh, of the path, plus a turn penalty every time you change streets. Okay, so what does that mean? And again, okay, so Isidore is going to go after me for not citing. I think this is Google Maps. So I'm writing the citation there uh, at the last minute. Um, so let's say that I wanted to go from here, that's my source, to there, that's my destination. So I'm given two intersection IDs and I need to find a path between them. So I could go up uh, Rose Street here. I notice it's a one-way street, but I'm going the right way, so that's okay. And then I could go along College Street and get to my destination. And the distances, you've actually already calculated this in milestone one. So let's say the distances of each of these street segments, well, 200 meters going this way, and then these ones add up to 300 meters going that way. So the travel time, I would just add up the travel time of each of the street segments I went down. And you have an M1 function to do that for you already. Okay, so I add all that up. Uh, I'm going to get a certain travel time. And I made one turn. So we're also going to give you a penalty every time you make a turn. So that takes some time as well. Okay, so that's my first path that I found. I might find another one. There are many paths here. So maybe I'm going to go down Cecil Street first, then up Beverly, and then I'll finish my path off. Okay, so I take that path instead. Okay, so which one of these, I'm going to erase my reference here. Uh, which one of these is better if that turn penalty is 15 seconds for every single turn? And turn penalty is a constant. So we're just going to charge you... We'll, we'll pass it into the unit test, set it to some number and pass it into your function. But for every test, it, it's a constant that's passed into you. Okay, so this blue path, uh, let's say that we have a speed limit of 40 kilometers an hour on, on Ross Street. And let's say we have a speed limit of 50 kilometers an hour on College Street. Well, we take those distances and divide by the uh, speed limit, which again, you already have in fine street segment travel time. And we had one turn. One turn there. So we add that all together and we get 54 seconds. The red path goes um, about the same distance, but we spend more of it on low speed limit streets and we wind up with two turns. One turn there, one turn there. And uh, if we add all that up, it's, slow, it's slower. So 71.4 uh, seconds. Okay. And I'm going to tell you exactly how to tell when you make a turn. We'll give you a simple function to tell when are you making a turn. Um, 
because I see some various questions about, uh, well, what about street lights and stop signs and so on? We're gonna give you a pretty simple rule because we don't wanna get bogged down in, in too much complexity about how much time on average you're gonna spend whenever you have to make a turn. Okay, that was the path. So you have to find, so in this example, what we'd want you to do is return this blue path. This one is the one that had a, a shorter travel time. So that's the one we want you to find in return. Okay, then you need to build a user interface and that's worth 6% of your mark. So, and there are several requirements that are laid out in the milestone three handout. You have to be able to enter two intersections and find the path between them. So somebody starts typing the names of, of streets or identifying an intersection somehow. And clearly, if you look at your milestone two functions, you have a method for the user to find an intersection by typing in street names. That's gonna be really useful if you have to get two intersections. So you're gonna build on your milestone two functionality. We also want uh, the end user to be able to find paths, not by typing, but also just by clicking on points in the map. So they should be able to click on two intersections, a start and an end, and you find the path in between them. And again, it should be pretty clear to you that this, some of your milestone two functionality looks pretty helpful for this. You already have the ability to click on one intersection and highlight it. Maybe you could like leverage that to be able to select two. Once you've determined what the, you know, this is the input. Okay, so we've got two different ways to input a request for a path. You're gonna call your algorithm. Your algorithm is going to find a path and now you wanna show it back to the end user. So you wanna visualize that path in the UI. So draw it somehow. Um, you also wanna give directions. So what I've shown here, I've on top of this Google Maps, I've actually drawn the path, maybe not very nicely, but I drew some arrows. You want to do a bit more than just drawing arrows of where do you go tell the person how to follow the path, where do you start. Which which way do you drive and so on, and then to make your user interface easy for someone to understand. Um, and, and your TA won't have no, won't know your user interface the first time he or she is using it so they're actually a good example of an in, inexpert user. Make sure you it's self documenting so have a way to get help, so maybe you have a help button, maybe you have tool tips. Um, Maybe you have a little tutorial that of splash screen that comes up when your map starts, you know, you choose, but somehow make sure that it's obvious how to use your interface. And uh, so that your TA can figure it out, right? One of the tests they're gonna do is, can they figure it out with you, without you telling them? Then they're gonna say, okay, well, tell me any special features or anything else I should do. But the more that your TA can figure out without you explicitly saying how to use it, um, the more intuitive your user interface will, will be perceived to be. Okay, um, how do you figure out usability? So I'm saying that you have to meet all these features, be able to do all these things. Your TA is going to assess the usability. Um, and that again, can be a hard thing for a team that wrote the code to understand. Is this intuitive? Is it easy to figure out? A really good way to do that is to try it on a friend or a family member. It's, you know, Can that person enter intersections to find a path between them without lots of pain? Um, they may type things that you never expected. Does that make your program crash? Can he or she follow the travel directions and the path display without you explaining what they mean? Because the idea is it's just so obvious that they can say, yeah, I could get in my car and I could do that. Okay, travel directions. So here's my, here's, here's Dr. Tom and I's first take on travel directions. So we're gonna say, take street segment number 21, then street segment number 10 and so on. And we'll just print that until we get to the end of the path. What do you think? Okay, so I see one looks good. This is like a natural way for us to print it because when you see what the algorithm outputs, this is pretty much what your algorithm is gonna output. A list of street segments or a vector of street segments is a good way for your algorithm to store its result. It's actually the way we want you to store the result. So we've just directly printed that. Uh, you know, this is unbelievably terrible, okay? It's unbelievably bad. It is impossible for you to make any sense of this. So yeah, no one knows what street segment number 21 is or number 10, so it's crazy. Okay, so here's our second try. Okay, we realized yeah, that's not so good. Um, so we said, take Young Street, then Young Street, then Bloor Street. So what we've done is we basically, we have this list of street segments, that's our answer. And instead of printing the IDs, we're now going and asking, well, what's the name of the street for that 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 street segment is part of. So we now say take Young Street, then then more Young Street, then Bloor Street. What do you think of that? 
Yeah, it's a bit better, but yeah, it's pretty bad. Okay, it's it's not good. It's a little better. I mean, this is bizarre. In our data structure, we actually have every street segment, but we're actually printing. If we had 12 street segments in sequence on Young Street, we're actually going to print, take Young Street, take Young Street, take Young Street. It makes our directions look, doesn't inspire confidence, right? That makes our directions look kind of bizarre. Okay, so that's not good. Uh, make sure the directions give you all the information you need to go from the start of the path to the finish of the path, which sounds obvious. Um, seems like, yeah, well, of course you would do that, but you'd be surprised at um, the majority of solutions will actually leave out some key information so that if you were actually trying to follow these directions, you wouldn't quite know what to do at certain points. Okay, so I'm not going to do this. We'll do this at the start of uh, next lecture. We'll just talk a bit more about what are some ideas you have to make these uh, usable. And uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's how far we're going to go today. Uh, I realize you may be tied up with Milestone 2, but if you get a chance, you can go look at the Milestone 3 handout and see the, the full specification. And I will stay on the line in case there are any questions, but that's, uh, that's all we have for today.